Halina Yanchinka writes, since February the 24th, 2022, Ukraine has enjoyed bipartisan support from the United States. And for that entire time, Russia has been looking for cracks in this support. Russia failed to achieve any downsizing in aid through military and diplomatic means. But the Kremlin is now seizing the opportunity of the fractious upcoming election period to refresh another time-tested tactic, information psychological special operations. Welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. If you enjoy the material we create, please like, subscribe, and definitely comment because it helps to boost the popularity of our videos in YouTube. It helps new people to discover the fantastic guests that we feature on the channel. Also, please check out the list of Ukrainian charities, uh, some of the strongest ones, uh, all of them uh, are very much endorsed by Ukrainians. Check them out in the description of this video. And if you like the material we produce, please do consider becoming a patron or buy me a coffee to support the work of the channel. Halina Yanchenko is a member of the Ukrainian parliament elected in 2019. She's authored a number of uh, legislative initiatives and is the primary author of more than 22 bills, of which seven have been enacted into law. One of the bills concerned restrictions of parliamentary impunity and another streamlined procedure for the investigation and accountability of members of parliament. Halina also has extensive experience in the business sector, specializing in sociological and marketing research. Now there is a huge, huge amount more I could read out in your bio, but let's actually jump into the interview. I'm delighted to welcome you to the channel. Hi. Yes, yeah, so hi everyone. It's a big pleasure and honor for me to be a part of this uh, this interview today and to share some of, some of the news and some of the ideas here from Ukraine. So greetings from Kyiv. Well, we're going to talk about quite a few things. And of course, people are going to be wondering about that fantastic painting that's just over your shoulders. I we'll have to address that at some point as well. But let's start with, I mean, the focus is going to be on the US election because it's absolutely critical for Ukraine support. But this week has seen a number of important events. One of those is the visit of Rishi Sunak to uh, the parliament in Kiev. And I understand you were present at that, uh, at that session. What impression did the speech and the announcements make on you? It was a great speech. Indeed, it was yesterday in the parliament as uh, and me as a member of parliament, I was present there. So basically, I've seen uh, Rishi Sunak just five meters away from me giving his speech. Uh, speech was great. There were many important points there, including uh, some of the reports about what Rishi Sunak just agreed with President Zelensky, a few hours before he actually gave a speech to the parliament of Ukraine. So they agreed about number of uh, basically defense, uh, defense points, which will uh, later became the defense agreement. Great Britain uh, is promising to uh, be a military ally and like general diplomatic ally of Ukraine for the next 100 years. So if anything like Russian aggression will happen again in the future, they will provide uh, military assistance or sanctions without even a request. So basically it will be a, a given thing. So there won't be a situation like uh, what happened on February 24, when basically millions of Ukrainians um, woke up at five in the morning in their beds from the sounds of explosions, uh, because Ukraine was bombed, Ukraine was surrounded from three sides, and in the same time, some Western allies were lost, and they didn't know what to do, how to react, should they provide a weapon or not, or maybe it's better to take time, yeah, and think about better ideas, but, like, really? Better ideas? What kind of better ideas can you come up with when... Uh, when basically a country in the heart of Europe is being uh, invaded by their aggressive totalitarian neighbor. I think we lost a lot of time. We, like, as a civilized world, we lost a lot of time uh, back, back then, in February 24, February of 2022, when, uh, when actually it was easier to stop Russians to... Uh, basically kick them uh, out of uh, our country. But it really took a lot of time to um, to basically negotiate the weapon 
supply to negotiate some sanctions and stuff like that. Still, we don't have sometimes some types of uh, military assistance which we desperately need. For example, F-16, two years after the full-scale invasion, and we still don't have them. We still can't have the basically this balance of the forces in air, which but makes it much more difficult to deoccupy our country, to uh, deoccupy uh, the cities, to liberate our people. There are millions of Ukrainians, civilian, uh, civilians who are basically victims of Russian on occupied territories and still atrocities are taking place there. And, and it's other our, system, yeah. And it is, and it is our joint responsibility. It is a joint responsibility of the whole civilized world that millions of Ukrainians are in occupation, that millions of Ukrainians are under the risk and danger of being kidnapped, tortured, killed. Uh, thousands of Ukrainian uh, children are being kidnapped and separated from their families and then forcibly adopted uh, in other Russian families. This is Russian state politics. And still, what are we doing? Why are we so reluctant as a civilized world? And you could make the case, of course, as well, that actually these deterrents doesn't just, or this failure of deterrence doesn't just date back to the full-scale invasion, but you could go back to um, uh, 2014 and actually the invasion of uh, Donbass, the invasion of Crimea, and the absolute failure of deterrence at that point, and in fact, the fairly anemic uh, sanctions that were placed on Russia, which had no effect whatsoever. Um, what do you think is... is, is, is uh, is this a, not just a failure of deterrence, but also the Budapest memorandums really put uh, a, a duty, not a legal one, but they put a moral duty on the US and Britain to try and protect Ukraine's security. 2014, really nothing was done to follow up on those uh, commitments that were made. How, how in the future is this going to be fixed? Well, first of all, let me say that Budapest memorandum is the most cynical thing in the world, probably. What was Budapest Memorandum about? So after the collapse of USSR, uh, basically three countries, which identify themselves as the leading forces in the world, and it was United States of America, Great Britain, and Russia, not talked in, but basically forced Ukraine to give away our nuclear weapon, which we had back to the time, to give away majority of our ammunition and weapon to Russia for free, for free. So basically just like give away. And uh, in exchange of that, we only got uh, so-called security guarantees. So if someone violates our borders, the three countries, including United States, Great Britain and Russia, will protect our borders. And in 2014, Russia, which uh, took away our weapon, which took away our nuclear weapon and also ammunition, basically in, uh, invaded and, uh, and uh, messed with our borders. And there was not uh, uh, no reaction. And basically what was... Uh, the reaction was that this is not agreement, this is uh, nothing serious, it's just a memorandum, this is not uh, important for actual implementation or anything like that. But it was a horrible thing from the side of United States and Great Britain, because it was basically a sign and a message, well, first of all, for Putin, hey guy, uh, you can go on. you can continue messing with your neighbors and other countries, and there will be no reaction, so start building uh, military uh, factories and start like storing more ammunition to basically like invade Ukraine or other countries. And it was also a very bad sign for other, for other countries, especially for totalitarian regimes across the world. And basically that's, we are, uh, that's what we are seeing now when uh, um, a lot of uh, politicians in the United States, they uh, kind of worry about what will happen between Taiwan and China. They worry about this uh, basically conflict or war uh, between Israel and Hamas or stuff like that. Basically, it was already a sign sent in 2014. And that was a very big 
huge mistake. Military mistake, di diplomatic mistake, and generally geopolitical mistake. Mm -hmm. Very much strategic mistake. And do we continue perhaps to underestimate Russia and what it is capable of? And I mean here the kind of malignant uh, behaviors that we're starting to see. I'm getting the impression from uh, its activity in the UN, um, the role of Wagner uh, uh, in the African continent, uh, especially sub-Saharan Africa, um, and of course the role in uh in Syria and the terrible atrocities there, and you mentioned Israel, it seems that Russia is the political representative in the UN of all the world's terrorists, um, autocracies, terrorists and tyrants, um, and that its capacity for creating chaos, for lighting fires around the world is almost unlimited. Is uh, I think Ukrainians obviously appreciate this, but is this message really getting through to uh, Western powers? Uh, you are absolutely right. I think this message is not getting there yet. Maybe only to some uh, to some individuals and to some politicians. Maybe to some European leaders. But basically, what uh, we can see now about Russia is that they start uh, messing not only with like countries far away, but uh, also on the European uh, continent. Uh, what, what is uh, Russian uh, strategy? They basically uh, test. They test their opponents. Uh, that were, that's uh, what happened basically with uh, Ukraine. So firstly, they uh, invaded in uh, in Crimea with some of their militaries, but without any like Russian flags or anything, then they were more active uh, occupying um, two regions uh, of uh, Eastern Ukraine. And then after there was no reaction, they were just not hiding anymore. And it was a full scale invasion with tanks and with uh, all the uh, basically um, um, army and stuff like that. What are they doing now in Europe? Uh, uh, yeah, pretty much like with uh, with the countries from European Union. First, they started to uh, to talk about uh, uh, the fact that uh, well, there are problems in Poland, there are pro problems in Baltic countries like Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. So Finland uh, and 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 stuff like that. That uh, this country, there are problems there, and maybe. It really makes sense for Russia to invade those countries and like kick their asses. Uh, then what they started to do next, they started to violate their uh, their basically uh, air territory. So there were already a number of facts when Russian military jets were flying over the territory of a different countries, which is basically uh, a fact of aggression uh, usually. What was the reaction? No reaction. Uh, what kind of reaction uh, there should be, basically, as uh, given the fact that it was a violation of a territory of independent and sovereign country, there should be a reaction either from that country or from a NATO as an organization. So basically, Article 5 should be applied. There should be a, like at least serious talk or better, like a more substantial reaction. No reaction zero so russia is acting just like a typical bully at school at high school they poke you they test you okay no reaction then they go further 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 and then it can have a very dramatic consequences we already seen that in many of uh, russian neighbors and now uh, i just really hope that uh, that uh, european union european countries and uh, and us will make some uh, conclusions and the media seems to unfortunately in the process it uses to compile the news and in some of the language uh, which is often used now this isn't to malign all journalists because some clearly are 
uh, very strong and and and, uh, and and you won't find these sort of weak um appeasing sort of headlines there I mean, uh, and uh, you know i've met many fantastic journalists since starting this uh channel uh edward lucas and others for instance would never write like this but the mass of journalism does seem to benefit sometimes uh, russian propaganda narratives by doing a kind of both sides type uh you know type of positioning uh, and also you know repeating lines that are put out by the uh, Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, etc., and then given them almost equal weight, or Russia says, Ukraine says, etc., etc. This style of journalism is dangerous in the situation we're in, because on the channel we warned that uh, disinformation warfare was really going to scale up this year because of the sheer number of elections that are taking place and the clear signs that Russia is keen on meddling in many of these electoral processes, especially in Europe. And of course, we have the US election coming up. So what is the danger of the way the media operates in the current environment of disinformation warfare and these, I would say, risky electoral processes? Well, I believe that uh, uh, media standards are important. And generally, it is important to give an opportunity to basically highlight both sides, but not when situation is very white and black. So basically, I can hardly imagine the situation when there is a report about, I don't know, sorry for that example, but a woman being raped on the street and then a journalist comes and asks for interview from her and then asks for, for interview from the basically uh, a guy who raped her just to give to balance the opinions i mean i'm sorry this is not what our moral standards are telling us what to do so if the situation is very white and black you as a basically as a as an authority and in ukraine we are, we say that uh, media or journalists are the fourth force yeah the, the fourth uh, basically um, uh, uh, branch of, of of authorities because they have such an influence they can influence public opinion and stuff like that so when situation is very white and black I think media should also understand their responsibility and so the, the, the consequences of how they highlight the situation. War in Ukraine, uh, full-scale invasion by, by Russia, is does not have any shadows of gray. It is very white and black. There was no provocation. There was nothing wrong done by Ukrainians. And then yet there was a this full-scale invasion and aggression from the side of our neighbor just because they suddenly decide that our country does not have a right to exist and our people does not have a right to uh, to live peacefully as a consequence for two years uh, there are constant shelling in our country children can go to school they are forced to uh, basically interrupt the classes and run to the bomb shelters, hiding from Russian missiles attacks. Children and adults are not sleeping at night because Russians, uh, their favorite time for attacks is between uh, basically 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. People are not sleeping for, for, I don't know, for months. Can you imagine like, yourself be in a situation when someone wakes you up every night from two to four and forces you to go to, I don't know, to garage or to bomb shelter to risk your life. And this situation is continuing, uh, continues with you for two years. The psychological just, warfare. It's not just physical. It's. Uh... I really want to, I really want our, um, uh, our audience to try to put themselves into shoes of Ukrainians and just think what were what could their emotions be and what could be their basically um, assessment of the situation and we live in it we Ukrainians we live in it for two years and, and understanding the psychological warfare is important because 
it tells you something about the Russian mindset. And one of the narratives which I have seen used uh, in the US election debate already, and which came up very strongly last year, at the same time as the so-called stalemate narrative that was definitely being amplified uh, by Russian assets uh, and various sort of channels, and of course, the useful idiots, and if people are familiar with that concept. But we're also going to see the narrative about negotiations coming up again and again. And we've seen an incredible amplification of this story, the full story, that somehow Boris Johnson destroyed a peace deal, that there was some real peace deal on the table, something that was reasonable and possible, and the you know, terrible, evil Western forces uh, destroyed the chances of peace um, early in 2022. This, of course, is absolute nonsense. If we look at the conditions and requests that were being made at the time, um, extremely unreasonable. Um, and it's clear from, you know, the pattern of the invasion and, as you say, the pattern of uh, these missile strikes that there is a form of uh, genocidal warfare going on Russia wants to erase Ukraine, but still we see this narrative about negotiations being a viable possibility coming up over and over and over again. Um, how would you tackle that? How would you dispel or argue against these, especially in the context of the US election? Well, the thing is that uh, Ukraine is very experienced uh, when it comes to negotiation with Russia. Um, since 2014, so basically it's 10, uh, for, for 10 years, uh, we've been attacked by Russia. And many politicians try to negotiate. Uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, as a president, he was running for the presidential election as a peacekeeper and peaceful candidate. He was trying to negotiate with uh, Putin. He said that he will do everything. He will fall on his knees just to stop this war. And he did tremendous work in order to, like, to try to talk Putin into some kind of, of a deal. Unfortunately, we see that Putin does not want any kind of negotiation. He's very aggressive. I think he has, I'm pretty sure that he has some mental problems. And probably he imagines himself as a Russian empire or, or someone who wants to just like invade and increase the the uh, the lands under his uh, under his ruling, which is absolutely uh, stupid and, and nonsense nowadays when the countries are democratic and they have their borders secured and stuff like that. So basically, uh, Zelensky was negotiating with Putin since 2019 when he won the elections and became a president. But uh, it didn't really give any results. It just gave Putin time to prepare uh, for the full-scale invasion, to get more uh, ammunition on his stocks, to basically uh, prepare more weapons and stuff like that. Furthermore, furthermore, after the full-scale invasion, we did a number of negotiations. Uh, Russia said that they will hold these negotiations uh, in the capital city of uh, Belarus, while Russian uh, army was actually attacking Ukraine from the Belarus side. So basically, they forced us to send our negotiation team uh, to the uh, hostile country. And you know what? We did that. Do you know what they did? They poisoned our negotiation group. So basically, they poisoned the head of the fraction of uh, the presidential party in the parliament. They poisoned uh, a minister of defense and some other representatives who, who we sent there. Our guys would be murdered. After that, we, we uh, said that we will um, continue negotiations only on the basically third country, which was Turkey. But we did a lot of efforts to actually have these negotiations. Russians violated each and every agreement we kind of reached. So we uh, we negotiated the so-called green corridors for civilians to basically leave the occupation. Uh, people were leaving on the civilian cars with huge signs, children on the front window of the cars. Uh, Russian soldiers had seen that there are women driving these cars and there are children in the cars and still they were like shooting these people uh, just out of fun, just to entertain themselves. Mm -hmm. And the if Russian... people 
if people Russians doubt this are, yeah. well, russians are people that don't know how to negotiate and then that can't uh, actually uh fulfill their fulfill their agreements we are very experienced with negotiation with russians unfortunately and it's not leading to anywhere and it's not leading anywhere and that is why we don't believe in negotiations anymore and that is why that's exactly why we believe that everyone who is forcing uh, to negotiate, they're just playing the Russian game. And if people doubt this, they should see the film 20 Days in Mariupol. It really highlights how Russia um, suggests things like humanitarian corridors uh, and then sort of plays mind games by cancelling it or even shelling and shooting those up. People need to have a memory of what's happened before, before suggesting, you know, ideas like like that. Let's tackle some more of these propaganda narratives, because we are seeing a number of candidates, um, both extreme candidates on the Democrat side, that's the, the Kennedy guy, uh, and on the, uh, on the other side, um, repeating and amplifying various narratives. One of these, of course, is that US aid uh, um, is somehow contributing to the uh, you know the erosion of infrastructure in, in, in the US, that the money sent to Ukraine is better used um, uh, in the US. But actually, this is to completely misrepresent what's going on. Um, and both Biden did recently say this, uh, hasn't been made forcefully enough, but most of the money that is earmarked for Ukraine remains in the US uh, and helps to build um, American jobs and uh, various industries associated with the military industrial complex. So how would you argue this so that an American can kind of get that aid for Ukraine actually helps the US? Uh, by the way, it's an air alarm in Kiev now, and I hope, but I hope that we can continue this interview and that if you... no Russian or Iranian drone or Russian missile will hit. Uh, if you need office. to go to the shelter, do do uh, go to the shelter if you need to. Um, I think that's fine because the shelter is uh, a bit far from here, so actually, and it's like it's happening on a daily basis. On a daily basis, it interrupts the working day. It interrupts the processes. But the most horrible when it actually interrupts your uh, your sleep at night. This is really devastating, and it makes you really angry. Even in Lviv, it was like four or five times a day. I was there for six days, and I counted every, every day four or five uh, air alerts, guaranteed. Obviously, as you say, one in the middle of the night just to uh, interrupt people's sleep. Yeah, yeah. So uh, getting back to your question, actually, I think it's a, it's okay because what we Ukraine need, we need weapon. We don't care why that weapon is manufactured, but we need it. We need ammunition to protect our people, to protect ourselves. This is our uh, survival need. But uh, one thing that is really important is that we need not not, not the few units that won't change the situation, we need like thousands and hundreds of them in order to actually like really change the situation on the front line and not just, you know, like making sure that Ukraine will not die. This is not how it works. Like we received, uh, I don't know, maybe like 18 or something high Marses from US. They were great. They really helped to, to um, save uh, thousands of Ukrainian, uh, of Ukrainian civilians. But in order to stop this war, in order to defeat Russia, we need hundreds of them. And this is really a disappointing point that we are not getting them, that everything is moving very slow, reluctantly. And uh, there is one thing uh, to, that should be communicated. Uh, the longer uh, we are in the war, the, the more expensive it is to defeat Russia. Because they are not, uh, they are also working. They are uh, manufacturing some ammunition. They uh, they have a lot of assistance from Iran, uh, North Korea, and China as well to build their military assistance, to build the, uh, or military capacities and stuff like that. 
while Western world already has it all. And if Ukraine receives a substantial amount of weapon and ammunition, not, you know, years or months after uh, after now, but like already now, it can really change the situation. And, uh, and we can like stop this war really, really quick. And the thing is that not only Ukraine suffers from this war, but uh, it's the, there are global problems. Uh, the food crisis, uh, the crisis with uh, basically inflation and stuff like that. So pretty much the whole world should be interested in order to stop this war as, as, as soon as possible. And there is only one way to stop it. It's Russian defeat and only one way to guarantee this substantial amount of military assistance to Ukraine now, not one day, but now. And you've also written very compellingly about Russian tactics, because it's very important, I think, to understand not just disinformation, but actually the tactics of how they try to achieve their objectives. And you've written that divide and conquer is certainly one, and divide and conquer is used um, amongst its its enemies, you know, UK, US, etc. They really try to deploy that. But they have other tactics as well. Another one is distract and dilute. That is just uh, give people other things to worry about, which dilute support for Ukraine. And then lastly, for those countries where um, they think they can make some traction or they can bribe, for instance, South Africa, I think, is a great example. They have another strategy, which is to flatter uh, and threaten. That's to give something, but also threaten to kind of take it away. So they have all these different strategies kind of going on. How should we counter these? And what is Ukraine doing to help its allies uh, counter these Russian strategies? Well, it's, uh, it's a big challenge to actually uh, work on that. What Ukraine is trying to do, and I think that uh, we kind of succeeded in that uh, in 2022, is uh, a lot of communication on one side. And then it's important not only to communicate from like our uh, with our voices, but also with the voices of uh, Western representatives. That is why we've been so open as a country. That, that is why we uh, welcomed uh, Western uh, media in Ukraine to report about what is going on. That is why we invited as many Western politicians as possible. Uh, President Zelensky uh, invited uh, even, a, even Trump couple of times to come to Ukraine, see what, what is going on with his own eyes and stop like talking weird things. Let's put it diplomatically, yeah? Because what I can say from my experience is that uh, we had some um, difficulties in communication and negotiations with uh, German politicians in the beginning of the full-scale invasion. So me as a, a co-chair of uh, Ukraine-German Interparliamentary Friendship Group, I was working a lot with uh, actually communicating with German parliament. And then I realized that it makes no sense to communicate them like online or virtually and stuff like that. It's important to actually take them and bring them to Ukraine so they can not only see war, they can touch it and they can feel it on their skin. This is an only thing that really might change the mindset of people. When uh, air alarm wakes you at night, while you you stay in Lviv or Kyiv or, or Odessa or another Ukrainian city, this is an experience that you don't want to continue. You don't want to happen to you anymore. And you realize that millions of people, millions of children live in that. And then you start taking actions because this is not normal. And, 21st century to let things like that happening and uh, yeah so basically we do a lot of communications we try we are very open we we are inviting people over in order for uh, in order to ba basically uh, balance this russian narratives what russians uh, try to do with uh, with atrocity with communication of atrocities they did in the kiev suburb uh, uh, region when they were shooting civilians and just letting them uh die on the streets and stuff like that after they left this uh, cities and after they left uh, uh, uh basically the north uh, of ukraine they tried to say that it's a fake and ukrainians were just you know like putting puppets or putting i don't know killing ukrainians and putting them on the 
uh, on the ground, this is absolutely nonsense. And only thing that really helped us to uh, to fight for truth is the fact that we invited Western politicians over and Western media, and they reported it. So there was a bigger trust. Yeah, really, it was a process of building trust. Um, uh, I think that's that's basically a, that's what helped us us to get the real allies in France, in basically in the West. And the last area I want to focus on, I think, is is a very important one. We've talked about how to counter these narratives. But what I've realized over the last uh, two years of doing this is it's very important to create an alternative narrative, an alternative reality that challenges propaganda, a strong story. And your activities in Parliament, your political activities, um, would seem to be very much geared up to... Uh, creating a better Ukraine and communicating why Ukraine is worth fighting for. So things like transparency uh, within business and investment, um, trying to encourage inbound investment uh, and creating an environment uh, which is good for foreign investors, uh, ensuring shareholder returns uh, and sort of guarantees of capital. You've also done a lot of work on uh, transparency within Parliament, uh, contracts, using e-procurement as a way of increasing transparency and tackling corruption. And uh, very importantly, um, you seem to be a strong voice on limiting the impunity of deputies so that actually parliamentarians uh, and, uh, dare I say, you know, apparatchiks and people are actually held to account um, uh, for, for you know, uh, and, and corruption and the opportunities of corruption are limited there. So I'd love to learn more about your activity and how you're creating a Ukraine that is worth fighting for, that is demonstrably different from uh, the Russian system and demonstrably different from, you know, the USSR or the Soviet system, uh, which uh, you all emerged from uh, sort of 30 years ago. Um, well, it's a variety of various activities, but currently uh, I'm very focused on the uh, on speeding up the victory day, just like as everyone, not only in Ukrainian politics, but in Ukrainian society. Ukrainian society are fantastic people. Uh, I remember March of 2022, basically only one month uh, after the full-scale invasion, when Russian soldiers were still around Kyiv, basically the capital city of Ukraine, and everything. And then uh, there was this public opinion poll and I'm a sociologist by training, so this is very important. I really love to, to go through public opinion poll to understand what is going on. And that public opinion poll says that about 90% of Ukrainians believed that Ukraine will win, which was absolutely fantastic when, you know, enemy almost surrounded your capital city. And then there was another question that explained why so many Ukrainians believed in the victory. Back to that time, about 80% of Ukrainians were doing something on a daily or weekly basis to speed up the victory. So when you are not just, you know, dreaming of someone, but when you are taking actions, then you have a right to believe in the victory. And that's what the whole society is doing. So basically, our society have turned into a huge volunteer organization when, when pretty much almost everyone is doing something. Uh, some people joined army. Some people were doing a lot of works to evacuate civilians who can't evacuate themselves. A lot of people were volunteering. Some people have started some manufacturer to help our defenders and stuff like that. Uh, what uh, uh, um, I'm doing specifically, I, I have a number of initiatives. I have a huge initiative for Ukrainian refugees. So basically, we started a website which helps to connect, uh, to, to build horizontal connect, connections between, between refugees who need some shelters and accommodation on one hand, and then people, Ukrainians and foreigners, who can provide this free of charge accommodation for refugees. Uh, we helped uh, over one million of Ukrainian refugees to find free of charge shelters through these initiatives. And I believe uh, it's very important to give people a chance to understand that someone is waiting for them somewhere. Someone can help them. Someone can provide the shelter and and maybe become your lifelong friend. Uh, I also do a lot of uh, work, uh, like communication 
work and diplomatic work, uh, explaining uh, what is going on, breaking some myths in the West. Uh, my recent article for um, Wilson Center in US, I believe, uh, 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 was very timely thing because uh, it was my impression after my visit to Washington. Uh, I've heard a lot of arguments from uh, a so-called Trumpist group, and I've seen a lot of manipulations, unfortunately. So people are telling only one part of the truth, and but they don't tell the whole uh, the whole picture, and then they start manipulate with this piece. So, for example, um, I've heard that a lot of uh, people are argumenting that uh, U.S. have provided. 44 billion US dollars uh, to Ukraine as a military assistance. 44 billion dollars. This is huge, yeah. And an average person, average US citizens would say, oh my gosh, why? Why, why do we do it? But in the same time, this amount is only half of a percent of the uh, defense, only defense budget of the US for 2023. So this is nothing. It's just like, you know, you don't even feel it. It's a rounding this, error, as they say. You know? this, this is the whole picture. This is the whole truth. Or, 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 or the fact that basically it, uh, Ukraine holds the majority of the uh, load and, and consequences of this war. So with uh, 44 billion of US dollars investment in the global peace, through helping through military assistance to Ukraine, uh, U.S. have uh, basically uh, caused huge damage to Russia because Russia have uh, spent uh, basically the four times more uh, resources uh, on the war with Ukraine. So basically, this is a very good investment. I mean, if you can invest one dollar and receive like four or five in exchange, wow, well, this is a good deal. Continue doing that. That's what any kind of investor. Banking will um, advise you. So this is very important to actually uh, un uh, uncover the whole uh, picture and uh, communicate to people. But also what really uh, drives uh, me and, uh, and the feedback that we hear uh, a lot from our European or American friends and allies is that it's amazing that despite the full-scale invasion, despite the air alarms or shelling, or uh, blackouts, which we had last winter when like there were days when we had no heating, no light because Russians damaged the, uh, the electricity and heating infrastructure. So despite all these uh, horrible circumstances, we have a functional parliament, we have a functional uh, government, we have a functional president who uh, who remains in the capital city and who travels to front line to support uh, army and our defenders from time to time. And uh, we continue with reforms. And uh, basically uh, uh, our uh, European friends, our European Union allies, they admitted and they uh, that's one of the reasons why we, we received their uh, the candidate status and why we actually received the status uh, uh, the, the status of the start of negotiation to become a full, uh, basically a full members of European Union. So this is something, I think, and this is what really drives me and makes me optimistic and makes me believe that we will win, of course, with the help of US, European Union and the rest of the civilized world. So we really count on your help. We need this it. Is this is an interesting lesson that you mentioned there, and that is that the level of belief in a political system um, does not necessarily, according to what you said, relate to uh, you know the quality of politics, the quality of politicians. It seems to relate to how active people are within that society and system. And this is this is an interesting one because you know, there are a lot of people who are getting very disenchanted uh, with western uh politics um and yet many are complaining in a passive fashion without looking around and thinking well, what problems could i resolve here and one of the speakers uh on the channel uh called sasha dojic who's a you know incredible academic she called this maidan ethics 
the idea that mass participation can solve problems. That's not to say there aren't problems, but it gives people optimism uh, that those problems can be solved. And it sort of enables them to look around and innovate methods to resolve these problems themselves, rather than sitting around waiting for, you know, somebody else to resolve it. So how important do you think um, was that process of the transformation of Ukraine, first in the Orange Revolution, and then especially in Maidan, to the kind of resilience and mass participation in Ukrainian victory that we see now? Um, I believe optimism is basically about faith in our own strength, in the strength of society, uh, big trust and uh, a lot of uh, joint actions. That's what helps us to uh, to basically uh, fight back and be uh, successful in this fight. But uh, this is very important, uh, of course, for us to actually uh, make sure that the civilized world is on our side because we are fighting for the values of civilized world. We are fighting for freedom. We are fighting for freedom of speech. We are fighting for for people to make the choice how they live and not for some, you know, like Putin or, or basically uh, authoritarian leaders to decide on uh, on the whole world and on on behalf of all um, all people how they should live and that's why we really become uh, we really we really believe in victory there is one more thing uh we know about your efforts we know about your inputs in this victory and we really want you united states of america to be a true part of this victory of ukraine that's a very powerful message, definitely. And the last thing is uh, the painting behind you. Could you briefly describe what's going on in there? Because I know a lot of people in the channel will be wondering because it's a spectacular piece. Um, what's what's going on in this scene? I absolutely love this picture. It's in my office. This is uh, the three Ukrainian soldiers are depicted on that uh, painting. Uh, it's a reminding uh, why I am here. Uh, who are the people, uh, uh, what kind of people are important for me in my life, in my work, and uh, who should I be thankful to for the fact that I'm living today, for the fact that I'm not dead, I'm not killed by Russian soldiers, I'm not killed by Putin and stuff like that, especially given that I'm an ascension list of Russia and I'm among the targets and stuff like that. But this is picture is very interesting because the title of this painting is Morning Coffee. Morning Coffee. So uh, basically it says that uh, morning coffee, the regular morning coffee for us might be a very different for someone else, for someone who is on the front line, for someone who is forced to basically uh, sleep in the cold weather or rain or snow or something like that. And we should value and appreciate our daily comfort because someone like Ukrainian defenders don't have this comfort and they enjoy a totally different type of morning coffee. It's an incredible work and what a fantastic story behind it as well. Um, thank you so much for everything you do. And of course, for spending some precious time on a Saturday morning to talk to me and uh, and the channel. Uh, Helena, thank you so much. Slava Ukraini. Hello, I'm Slava. Many thanks for this interview. Appreciate it.